Okay. So, uh, all right. So, I'm going to talk about uh, this particular thing called Fermat's last theorem. But what I'm going to try, I'm going to, what I want to emphasize, and perhaps one thing you perhaps could take away from this talk is the importance of perseverance. Right. So, somehow the, this is a, let me put up two dates on the board. This problem was formulated in 1637, right? So, 17th century. Uh, and then it was solved in the period. So, this was formulated by a French mathematician. At that time, there was no sort of category called mathematicians, right? People do it, did it as a hobby. He was an amateur mathematician. He worked as a judge in the southwest of France in a town called Toulouse. And uh, he's one of the great mathematicians of all time. So, he formulated a problem, right, in 1637, which is how many years ago? More than, I can't do the arithmetic, okay, but <laughs> more than 300 years ago. And then it was solved uh, in the period from 1986 to 1994, right, I put, I put down this period because uh, the person who solved it, uh, he's now Sir Andrew Wiles, right, he kind of thought about this problem continually for seven years. Uh, six of the years was in secret, right, because he didn't want to tell anyone, this was a very notorious problem. If you told people that you were working on it, they, they might think you're kind of crazy. Right? But he had the courage to think about this problem, I'll and I'll tell you when, from what he derived his courage. And for, seven, for, for eight years, he worked on this problem. He was, of course, quite famous by then already. He was a professor at Princeton, and he did seven years of uh, such work in his attic in his house in Princeton. And uh, then he announced the proof in 1993, and then the proof sprung a leak. It turned out to be slightly wrong. Then he took another year from 1993 to 1994 to actually finish the proof. Right, so, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a an extraordinary uh, story of just doggedness, perseverance, ingenuity, which allowed him to solve this problem. Right, so it's kind of he, he's certainly a hero of mine and of many other people working in the subject. So this was solved by Andrew Wiles in this period. Right, so how many of you have heard of Fermat's last theorem? Some of you. Okay. All right. But not to worry. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it is. Okay. So any questions so far? So yeah, what you have to take away is that mathematics. You might be asked to solve questions, and for example, in like 10 minutes, or right, sometimes, or when you're doing, a, doing it as a student, you're giving given homework exercise, and you just uh, turn turn back the sheet within a week. But actually, what uh, what mathematics research is all about is just marathon. It's a marathon race. It's not a hundred meter race. Right? So typically, if you really want to do something significant in mathematics or in these kinds of subjects, you have to concentrate, work hard for several years, have some distant mountain as your goal, right, like the Mount Everest, and use it to orient your efforts. And then hopefully, at maybe at some point, you might get lucky and solve the problem. Even if you don't get lucky, that thing will kind of make, take you on a path. Right? You have to think about an interesting problem, and it will take you on a path. And I wanted to emphasize that aspect of mathematics. Right? OK. So that's that. So let me start with my slides. OK, okay so what is Fermat's last theorem? It is a statement that an nth power of an, like the cube of an integer Right? We, all, we all know what integers are, 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, etc. The cube of an integer can never be the sum of two cubes of integers, right? Or a fourth power cannot be the sum of fourth powers, etc. So now somehow this is false for, sec for squares because somehow we know, for example, the Pythagoras theorem, right? So we have an example of a Pythagorean triangle with integer sides, 3, 4, 5, right? 3 squared plus 4 squared equal to 5 squared. Am I right? I'm, I, I'm not very good, though I'm a number theorist, I'm not very good at actual numbers. Okay, <laughs> but hopefully this is right. 3 squared plus 4 squared equal to 5 squared. 9 plus 16 equal to 25, right? And there are many other solutions. 5 squared plus 12 squared equal to 13 squared. So if you look at squares, somehow there is no uh, dearth of some squares, which are sums of two squares, right? But Fermat, this kind of uh, person working after having a long day of whatever, legal proceedings uh, as he was a judge of some kind in Toulouse, at the end of his day, he used to kind of think about mathematics, right? That was his leisure activity. Uh, how many of you do math, math as leisure here? <laughs> okay, all right. So, uh, so anyway, he used to think about math, and uh, so he was reading a very famous book at that time. I mean, even now, but uh, uh, called Diophantus, some Diophant and whatever, I mean, something, some uh, book about arithmetic, which is another name for number theory. What is number theory? Let me first of all say, number theory is actually about things we've learned in nursery school, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, just the natural numbers. But you ask for solving uh, equations in, in natural numbers, right? So these things which we learn in nursery school and which most of us think we've understood, number theorists kind of spend their entire life thinking about that, right? So it's about something very, very elementary, but the questions which it leads to when you think about equations and solving equations in integers, they have some of the hardest problems in mathematics, right? So number theory is about numbers, okay? So anyway, so uh, Fermat made this assertion that while he, of course, knew that sums of squares can be, the sum, uh, can be a square, he said that a sum of cubes can never be a cube. 
the sum of fourth powers can never be a fourth power, and so on and so forth, right? So the exact statement is, Fermat's last theorem is the statement that the equation x to the n plus y to the n equal to z to the n has no solutions in integers x, y, z with, with all of them non-zero, as long as the n, the exponent, is bigger than 2. Right? Does everyone grasp the statement of this problem? Perhaps that's another second thing you can take away. Then you can stop paying attention. <laughs> once, once you know two things. Mathematics is about perseverance. And secondly, if you know Fermat's last theorem, that perhaps is more than I would get in most uh, math lectures when I was your age. Okay? So, uh, so, okay, so it's the statement that the equation has no solution in integers x, y, x, y, z with x, y, z not equal to 0. Right? Fine? Okay. So in this talk, I would like to tell you the story of this problem. So this problem took how many years to solve? Again, I can't do the arithmetic. Maybe some of you can tell me. 1637 to 1994, certainly more, more than 350 years. It took 350 years for this problem to be solved. And the other thing about Fermat's last theorem is the statement by itself has no, has no particular kind of uh, applications to anything, right? But it's just a tantalizing question. It became tantalizing because it was, first of all, stated. Fermat claimed a proof, right? But for 350 years, no one could find this proof, or no one could find any proof, right? So the common sort of uh, consensus now is that Fermat was mistaken in thinking that he found a proof. Though he was a very great mathematician, sometimes you can make some sort of innocent-looking assumptions which turn out to be wrong, right? So somehow he extrapolated from what he knew, we'll come to that, and people think that he was wrong, right? But he was wrong in such a, because if he had solved the problem, in fact, mathematics would have suffered because this problem acted as a muse, right? It acted as a stimulant to mathematicians to do, develop whole fields of inquiry, which in some sense have far more importance than the solution of Fermat's last theorem. So that's another feature of mathematics that a uh, problem uh, can kind of stimulate efforts, right? Uh, and those, the answer might be more interesting than the question. So Fermat's last theorem is a curiosity. It became notorious because uh, it was formulated by a great mathematician who claimed a solution. No one could find the solution after 350 years of intense effort by the community. And uh, the fact that it resisted solution was very important to the subject because it forced people to come up with ingenious ways which led to the development of the subject of whole new theories, which in the end was solved, were helpful in the solution. Right? So somehow, I mean, the problem, the fact that it resisted solution is very important. Okay. Any questions so far? I'm telling you about the sociological aspect before really actually talking about the technical aspects. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because number theory is not about mathematics, it's not it's about calculation, it's about ideas, concepts, right? So, for example, if you look at three number theories, they go to a restaurant and try to figure out at the end of the <laughs> nice meal how much each owes, right? If you divide by three, maybe they'll falter. Maybe you, you, you right? So, somehow it's, it's not associated, uh, number theory, I mean, mathematics is not associated with being a very good calculator. You might be. Right? Ramanujan, for example, I'm told, was very good with numbers, right? but somehow you don't have to be. Right? That, that's another thing I want to tell you about mathematics. That mathematics act is perceived as a very exact, exacting discipline, which of course it is in some form, but it is also very forgiving. Right? You don't have to be perfect, you have, you, but the thing is you have to persist. You have to be interested and you have to keep persisting. And mathematics is like a very forgiving subject. As long as you have something to offer it, it will use it. Right? So somehow you should not be so discouraged. For example, I struggled a lot in, in, my, in my graduate student days. And, but it doesn't matter, right? As long as you kind of keep, keep at it, and if you're kind of sincere perhaps, or if you're really interested, things will work out. Okay? So that's another thing I wanted to tell you. All right. Okay, any other question? Okay, now let me, tell, let, let me give you a kind of a poetic uh, kind of, uh, let me borrow, in fact, somebody's words to tell you about the, the poetry of number theory. Right? So this is a very, very great contemporary number theorist, Barry Mazur. He says, somehow he wants to kind of point out the fact that these problems, these innocent looking problems, right? This Pierre Fermat's, his problem looks very kind of, I, I, anyone can understand it, right? I think a 10 year old boy could understand it, a 10 year old boy or girl. So uh, it's something, it's not difficult to understand, right? So it looks very innocent, you can start thinking about it, but it may not be so easy to solve, right? So, and the, but then once you're seduced by the problem, then you can't stop thinking about it, right? So that, that is captured by this, the field number theory produces without effort innumerable problems which have a sweet, innocent air about them, like tempting flowers. And yet, the quests for the solution of these problems have been known to create from nothing of theories which spread their light on all of mathematics. Let, let me skip the next two, three lines. Number theory swarms with bugs waiting to bite the tempted flower lovers who, once bitten, are inspired to excesses of effort. Right? So it's trying to capture this kind of tantalizing feature of number theory that the questions are very accessible. 
They're very simple looking questions, but the answers actually are sometimes are very elaborate. They take 350 years, right, to come about. So that's a, but the thing is, the, the, but that's the, that's the genius of Firma also, that somehow unwittingly perhaps, but, but of course guided by his intuitions and perhaps his taste as a great mathematician, he kind of formulated this question, and then somehow it turned out to be very generative of new mathematics, okay? So that's, as, as Andrew Weiss, in fact, was telling me last week, Fermat's last theorem has one of, as a unique, not unique, but it's kind of a curious distinction that has led to two great developments, one in the 19th century, as we'll come to, and then one in the 20th century. So twice it has kind of, uh, it has invented whole new, new fields of mathematics, right? So it's a problem which has paid rich dividends twice. Okay, any other questions? Please interrupt me because I'm not, in a, I'm not in a hurry to get to the end of the slides. I might stop only after 10 slides, right? I want to just communicate to you some, some what it means to be a mathematician or whatever, what it means to think about a problem. Okay, so any questions? Okay. Okay, so, so, so after Barry Mazur's statement, so Fermat's last theorem is one such problem, a rare flower that has inspired a lot of beautiful mathematics, right? Okay, so let me, uh, okay, so now, uh, uh, so, what, so number theory is about numbers, right? So one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, right? But um, so this is these are like kind of you can think of numbers in the sky, but the stars in the in the, in the firmament, right? Uh, the stars are the prime numbers. Does everyone know what a prime number is? So is nine a prime number? Let's take a vote. No, why? <laughs> three. Okay. So it's prime numbers, right? So the prime numbers are two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, etc. Right? They have they they, rec they could go on infinitely often. The dot 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 is one of the oldest theorems in the subject. The never end Euclid's theorem, right? The primes are infinite. And uh, they are the fundamental, they are like the, they are like the analogs of uh, uh, atoms, right? Everything is made out of prime numbers. So every number can be written as a product of prime numbers, right? So for example, 60 is equal to 2 squared times 3 times 5, right? So every number can be broken up into prime numbers. So, uh, so they are the fundamental building blocks of the integers, okay? Any questions about this slide? Most of you know all this stuff, right? Yep. So I'm going to I, not emphasize the technical part of mathematics, but I'm going to just tell you kind of stories, maybe. Is that fine? Okay, all right. Okay, the, pre, the key property, and this, this is some property whose extrapolation into sort of unknown domains led Fermat to error, possibly. Right, the key property of a prime number, which is not really obvious, though one might think it's obvious, right, is that if a prime p divides the product of two integers, right, suppose p, suppose p divides something, product of two things, then it either divides, then it has to divide one of them. Right, so certainly this is not, a, this is not true of a number like six, because six divides two times three, but it neither divides two nor three. Right? So a prime number has this key property that if it uh, divides the product of two things, then it divides one of them. Now this seems almost kind of very intuitive, but if you try to think of this in some larger sets of numbers, then it turns out to be wrong, right? And this is one reason why Fermat might have been mistaken in thinking he has a solution. Any questions? All right. Okay, so let, uh, so in 60, sorry, let me, uh, the history is that for, in 1637, Fermat wrote in the margin of a book of Diophantus that he was reading, that he had actually, he claimed that he had a truly marvelous proof that there were no solutions of this equation we talked about, right? And he said that, alas, this margin is too small to contain my proof, right? So, so he had this idea. But it's curious that he never claimed this, uh, he never claimed a proof of this ever again in his life, right? So maybe on that evening after maybe having drunk some pot or something, he was in a good mood and he thought he had a solution, but he never re reiterated that claim, right? So he was a great mathematician. He often made claims, which he never, because at that time mathematics was more like a, People are doing it for its own sake, like a puzzle. So he used to post problems to his friends by correspondence, right? No email that time, so he had to actually post letters. Took a long time to go back and forth. And uh, then he used to challenge people to come up with solutions to problems he knew how to solve, right? And often he was vindicated because people did actually find the solutions or they found, man, they, they, they kind of found evidence that Fermat had solved it. But this Fermat's last theorem, there is no such sort of evidence that he solved it. Right, so this was uh, something which led mathematicians on a wild goose chase for 350 years, right? And, uh, it, but it was not so wild because it actually resulted in the creation of lots of interesting, deep, and fundamental mathematics. Okay, so no one was able to prove this statement for 350 years, as I said. Okay, here's Pierre de Fermat, right? Looks kind of very dignified, like, looks like a judge. Okay, all right. So now this is the, 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 the at that time, the sort of the, Lingua franca, right, the kind of universal language for the scholarly discourse was Latin, at least in the West, in Europe. So uh, th this is the problem in Latin. We are, how many of you know Latin? Oh, you actually do? Okay, I thought there would be no one. All right. I, I certainly don't. Uh, so, okay, so this is the problem in Latin. Okay, it's again expressing the same thing, that cubes cannot be the sum of two cubes, etc. 
Okay, and this is the copy. This is a sort of fac facsimile of the book he was reading, this uh, Diophantus' book of arithmetic, right? Okay, so uh, although Fermat's general proof is unknown, his proof of one case has survived, right? The n equal to 4 case. So Fermat, so somehow squares were out of it. Uh, so the first thing to think about was cubes and fourth powers. So Fermat posed the cases of n equal to so small values of n, 3 and 4, as a challenge to his correspondence. Right? And, but one of the curious features of Fermat's uh, claim is that he never again claimed the proof. Right? So maybe he might have realized that he really didn't have a proof. Right? This often happens to me. You, 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 you try to prove a statement, you think you have a proof, right? but in a week or so it kind of suddenly springs, leaks. Right? So some of one, one can easily, in mathematics it's very, it's all, you have to be very rigorous and you have to have a complete proof. Right? So sometimes you might think you have a proof, for, and in all good faith you might think you have a proof, but it turns out to be wrong. Right? So it might have happened to Fermat. Any questions? All right. Okay, so this is some, maybe, maybe somewhere in Latin here is the statement of his problem. And of course, the English translation is, it is impossible to separate a cube into two cubes, a fourth power into two fourth powers, or in general, any power than, higher than the second into like two like powers. Right, I have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this, which this margin is too narrow to contain. And in fact, when Andrew Wiles solved the problem in the introduction of his paper, he says on September 19th, 1994, he came to a marvelous revelation, right? Which kind of showed, which, uh, which uh, was the final idea needed for him. So he echoed Fermat's words. Marvelous, marvelous. Okay. All right. Okay, I've, I've kind of said this already. Right, okay. But besides number theory, actually, Fermat was a great mathematician. In some sense, he was, uh, he kind of uh, anticipated ideas of calculus. He's, he was interested in physics. He... Uh, he, uh, he kind of developed this sort of principle of least action and cal calculus of variations. He was involved in the birth of probability, right? So he was, he was a mathematician of a very broad uh, sort. Number theory was, was, was very close to his heart, right? He really liked number theory, amongst other things. Okay. So, okay, so uh, while man, many mathematicians were, were drawn to work on it, right? because Fermat was a famous guy, right? Uh, to become famous, it's, it's, it's one, one, one way of becoming famous is, so, is to solve the conjecture of a famous man, right? So Fermat had this qualification. As he had claimed the proof, many mathematicians worked on it, but some people also dismissed it, right? Because some people said, what, what, what's the point of this, knowing the solution? Is, well, why should one care, right? That, uh, whether an nth power is, not, is equal to the sum of nth powers. It's, it's not an intrinsically interesting statement, perhaps. It's just a natural question. It's a more, it's more like a yeah, something you could think about, but uh, certainly it resisted solution. That, that it was really hard to solve. It. That was certainly true. So Kumar, one of the great mathematicians, German mathematicians of the 19th century, called it more of a joke than a pinnacle of science. Though he he, he made some of the deepest contributions to the solution of the problem. Right? Maybe I'll wait for the phone to go off. And he came as close to anyone had come to proving it before 1994. Carl Friedrich Gauss, another one of the greats of the subject, refused to work on it, saying that there are a thousand other questions one can ask like this. Why should I choose to work on this? Right? I mean, I don't know. Some of these are some pronouncements, one is somewhat hearsay. Okay. So uh, the point is why, why is the solution, why is the equation, uh, uh, why is the situation different for n equal to, let's say, 1? Of course, x plus y equal to z has many solutions, right? And n equal to 2, sum of 2 squares, because somehow the correspond you're both, when you're thinking about Fermat, you're, you're looking at the, when you're looking at the n equal to 2 case of Fermat, right? You're thinking about the circle x squared plus y squared equal to 1. Right? And then you're asking, what are, what are, this, what are, the, solutions of the, what are the solutions of this equation? Right? And somehow, I mean, this is a circle, right? You want to find rational points on it. In the sense, you want to find x, y rational numbers, so fractions, uh, which satisfy this equation. And then, there's, in fact, there's a formula. You can just kind of, you can write, uh, you can parameterize points on the circle. Right, somehow by 1 minus t squared upon 1 plus t squared and 2t upon 1 plus t squared. Right? And somehow you just plug in, you can easily check that this satisfies the equations of the circle. And if you just plug in any value of t, like 3 fourths or something, you can, then you find rational solutions. Right? So somehow the geometry of the circle is rather simple. I mean, somehow the circle is the, is the domain of trigonometry. Right? You know how to parameterize points on, on the circle. It's cos theta, sine theta, right? And then because of the sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equal to one relation, right? And then if you express these trigonometric functions in terms of tan theta by two, you get this equation. Yeah, parameterization. How do you, uh, do you define rational parameterization? I'm not, I'm not going to define it. I, I, I'm giving you an example. This is a rational parameterization, yeah. You, you, you kind of parameterize your solutions in terms of, uh, 
rational functions of some variable t. That's what I mean. Okay, I'm not going to emphasize definitions in this talk. I want to emphasize just giving you the, some, getting across some ideas. Yeah. Okay, in the proof, the proof takes thousands of pages. It is impossible to explain in, 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 in a lecture of Vana. Because the, the, the proof of Andrew Wiles is extremely sophisticated. It draws upon 300 years of uh, development of the subject. And uh, yeah, it's kind of, you, you'll probably need to take grad, several graduate courses to understand it. Yeah. Sorry? Just, just Google Andrew Wiles from us last year. I, I did, it's not. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you later. It's, it's in a journal called Annals of Mathematics. Okay. Summary. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is, this is kind of telling you the geometric idea of how to produce a rational parameterization of the circle. You kind of fix a rational point on it, like minus one zero, and then pass lines through it of slope t, and then where it'll hit the circle in some other point, because you're basically solving a quadratic equation, and some of this produces you the parameterization. Anyway, you don't really need to understand this. Yes? Yeah? That is the parameterization. I've already written it. Take m equal to t here. It is just some way of kind of capturing all the points on the on, on the on the circle in a nice way, in terms of polynomial uh, rational functions of t, quotients of polynomial. Yeah. Okay. So now, actually, so now uh, Fermat's last theorem, this assertion was tested by people from lo lots of values of n and ch ch checking for very large values of x, y, z. If you get somehow, if you get some kind of eccentric or some sort of unexpected solution. Right, but somehow in mathematics, it's never enough to check something just for large, large number of values, right? Because somehow, of course, that makes it more plausible. It can kind of it can it can give you a counter. It can certainly produce a counterexample if you find one, right? But just because you haven't haven't found a counterexample doesn't mean you proved the statement, right? For example, there was this other thing which Euler had thought about: whether the sum of some variation on Fermat, whether the sum of three fourth powers can be a fourth power, right? So that's just you're adding one more power on the left-hand side. It, so now this was also expected to be true for a long, long time. But in the 1990s, so 300, 300 years after Euler, someone, Noam Elke, is working at Harvard, produced this solution to, to this equation, right? So the sum of three fourth powers can be a fourth power, right? While Fermat had proved the sum of two fourth powers is never a fourth power. And of course, the values of uh, the solutions are pretty large, they're 95,000, right? They're pretty large values. So one might experiment and say, say up to Lots of values. It's uh, there are no there, there is no solution of this equation x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus z to the fourth equal to w to the fourth. But so, but, the, but in this case it turned out it had a solution. So just checking something numerically is really not a proof, right? One is still anxious, nervous. <laughs> is it have I searched long hard enough? Have I? So in in, in mathematics the holy grail is to find a proof, right? Which 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 stands. Uh, which, stand, which is valid in the court of law of mathematics, which is logical validation. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is Euler. Okay. So in fact, Euler, Fermat did prove the n equal to four case of his equation. He proved that a sum of two fourth paths is never the sum of a four, is never a fourth path, right? And now, if you think about it, after this thing, after he did this, and because of the fact that every number n can be written as a product of primes, all you have to do is to show that the Fermat equation fp, which is the equation x to the p plus y to the p plus z to the p equal to zero, has no solutions in integers x, y, z with x, y not zero, right? So the fp is the equation that for primes p bigger than two, right, and p prime, you're looking at the equation x to the p plus y to the p plus z to the p, it doesn't matter whether you put it on this or that side, is equal to zero. Right, you have to look at this curve, you can think of this as x, y, z with let's say complex numbers or real numbers as x, y, z. And then you have to figure out what are the integer solutions of this. And Fermat's last theorem now is the assertion that this equation for, for odd primes p has no solutions in integers x, y, z as long as none of them is zero. Right, so somehow you can reduce to this case because of Fermat's uh, proof for n equal to four. Okay, this is a simple exercise for you to do that uh, to prove Fermat, right, you can just check this particular case, and this is the key case, when the exponent is an odd prime number, right, any questions about that? It requires you a moment of thought, but I'll leave that thought to you. Okay, now Fermat actually had in his arsenal a few tools, right, because he was a, he was a very, he was, he was 400, 350 years ago, he was kind of an inventor of modern number theory, or whatever. 
because the, what Fermi discovered in number theory is still forms basically the uh, content of a first year undergraduate course in number theory, of a undergraduate course in number theory. Right, so Fermat invented the form of number theory that we practice now. Right, he invented the basic ideas. So, uh, but but the basic ideas were he knew some, he he knew some method. One 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 of his famed methods is that of infinite descent. Right, he was very proud of the method, and it was uh, some kind of uh, universal key which opened several locks for him. So this idea idea of universal uh, descent is that if you want to show that an equation has no solutions in integers, you start with an alleged solution. Right, and try to show that, that the existence of that solution implies the existence of a solution with smaller size. Right, and of course, they, they, they cannot be an infinitely decreasing sequence of natural numbers. Right, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so that was his method of infinite descent. I'm just going to, again, telling you the basic idea. Uh, that, uh, that, that is one thing he had. And somehow the infinite descent method is known not to really be effective for, uh, for the Fermat's last equation, last theorem, uh, once the exponent becomes bigger than 4. Right, so some of the infinite descent method is related to the curve x to the p, p plus y to the p plus z to the p having some structure, right? some group theory type of structure, some structure which enables you to apply descent and that structure vanishes or does not exist as once p is bigger than 3. Right, so some of Fermat had beautiful and very ingenious methods uh, at his hand invented by him, but somehow they were inadequate for proving Fermat's last theorem. Okay, uh, the other thing he had was uh, this idea of congruences, right? So let me explain to you what congruence is in a brief. How many of you know congruence arithmetic, modular arithmetic? Right? Okay, so some of you know. No, no, for P equal to 2, it has solutions. Ah, but okay, but in this form, the, the, the form I've stated, it doesn't. Yeah, you have to put C to the P on the other side. Yeah, yeah it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, so what is congruence? So, so somehow congruence is to invent a new, 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 uh, new world of numbers. Right? We know the number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. But now you invent for each n, right? Some of each natural number n, you invent a new system of numbers which is called, called numbers modulo n. So, right? so, so, so each n, so for example, let me look at n equal to 4. So, the, so you, you create, create the system of numbers where there are only four numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3. There is also 4, but you declare it to be equal to 0, right? So it doesn't, it's already seen. So these are the remainders you get when you divide a number by 4. Right? And so somehow this is a new system of numbers, there are only four of them, and then you, 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 de you define how to add them and multiply them. Right? So what, do you, what, what are you going to declare 2 plus 2 equal to? Of course it's equal to 4, but the remainder 4 leaves when divided by 4 is 0, right? so you call it 0. So 2 plus 2 is equal to 0. Right? So if someone uh, saw this after I walked out of the room, they thought the professor must have gone mad, right? because 2 plus 2 is not 0. But, but we have created this new system in which 2 plus 2 is 0. So in terms of we are looking at numbers, all numbers from the point of view of the number 4, right? So we are just looking at remainders when you divide by 4. So for example, what is, uh, what is let's say, 3 times 3? Of course, it is equal to 9, but then somehow you just peel off all the multiples of 4 and leave yourself with the remainder, right? So this is equal to 1. So everything, this is mod 4 arithmetic. Right, for example, what are the squares in this, in this world of numbers? So 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1. Right? Uh, 2 squared is 4, which is equal to 0, and 3 squared is 9, which is equal to 1. So there are only two squares in this system of numbers, 0 and 1. So half of them are squares, half of them are not squares. Right? Okay, so this is something he knew about, he invented rather, this kind of uh, working, working, uh, working, working at looking at numbers, because the numbers are infinite, right? Somehow you kind of create a model of numbers, which is a finite system of numbers, right? Which, which somehow, I mean, you can try and study the, the question you want, actually, by studying these simple simplified model of numbers, okay? So that was some system he had. So every number, when you square it, right, either leaves a remainder of 0 or 1 when you divide by 4. So now this was another way of uh, analyzing equations. Suppose you want to show that an equation has no solutions in integers. You can just say, oh, if it, had, if, if it doesn't have a solution in the simplified model of numbers, then it cannot have a solution in the original world of natural numbers, right? So this was a device he knew. But somehow, again, that's not very effective for Fermat. Okay, so anyway, I just wanted to tell you this, okay? So I'm going to skip all this. Uh, okay, so the, the, these, these are a couple of tools he had at his disposal, infinite descent, congruences, this, this subject is called congruences, okay. Uh, and then now, what, what, what is the explanation for why Fermat might have been mistaken in thinking that he had a solution, right? Because uh, as I said, in, numbers have the property that every number is the product of primes in a unique fashion, right, up to real. Of course, you can write 6 as 2 times 3, you can write it as 3 times 2, but that's kind of silly, right? 
per permuting things around and so on. But there's fundamentally only one way of writing a natural number as the product of prime numbers. But this kind of property fails when you try to extend your system of arithmetic to slightly a slightly kind of enlarged system of numbers. For example, you can look how do you get uh, for example, you can look at these numbers z root minus 5, right? So these are numbers of the form a plus b root minus 5, where a, b are integers. Right? So now again, you can do arithmetic with them. You can add such numbers, multiply such numbers, sometimes divide such numbers, okay? And, uh, but now in this, in this system of numbers, this, uh, this sort of uniqueness of factorization, which is the technical term for what I said was earlier, right, fails. Somehow you can write numbers as a product of what, might, what, what you might call primes, but actually you have to refine your notion of primes, okay? But, uh, and there is no uniqueness of factorization. For example, 6 is 2 times 3, and 2 and 3 cannot be factored for, further in this world of numbers. Right? You cannot write 2 and two or 3 in, in, in any interesting way. You cannot decompose it. But it's also equal to 1 plus root 5, root minus 5, times 1 minus root minus 5. Right? Exercise for you. Okay? So this is a, this is a way of writing 6 as, in, in, as a product in two different ways, which are fundamentally different. Right? So the unique, this unique factorization into prime numbers, one has to refine, as I said, one, the, one of the great inventions of, uh, one of the great theories of mathematics which came from this field, uh, from the solution, uh, from the, from the attempt to solve Fermat, was a, was a system of, was, was an abstract notion of ideals and ring theory in some sort of algebra, abstract algebra, which kind of at least resolves this problem. But the natural guess is wrong, right? And in, in an enlarged system of numbers, unique factorization fails. So the plausible guess is that maybe Fermat might have thought that unique factorization holds for some enlarged system of numbers, and then you can easily come up with a proof of Fermat's last theorem, right? So somehow that could be a positive explanation for why such a great mathematician might have been mistaken in thinking he had a proof. Any question from the, from the back? Everyone at the back is very quiet. Okay. All, all good? All right. Okay. Okay, and again, I'm not going to really, so the, the reason why sort of enlarged system of numbers force yourself upon you, right, when you, when you try to think about, uh, about Fermat's equation, for example, even if you try, try to look at the simplest case, which of course is not part of Fermat's assertion, but Fermat, for example, was very interested in sums of squares problems in general. So, for example, if you look at the equation x squared plus y squared, right, somehow if you want to analyze it, one useful way is to go beyond the system of rational numbers or integers. And can you, can, can, can I have a light on this? And then you can, you can, you can write, factorize it as x plus i y into x minus i y. What is i? What is this i? It's not me. <laughs> i square root of minus 1, right? So somehow in the complex plane, if some of you have seen this, this is i, right? So i is uh, i squared equal to minus 1, okay? So anyway, so this is, so if you want to analyze sort of these sums of powers, uh, kind of you're forced to look at numbers which are sort of beyond the system of integers, right? You have to look at complex numbers. So, uh, and then you might be working with the system of numbers zi, right, which is numbers of the form a plus bi, where a, b are integers, okay? So somehow that's kind of related to Fermat's last theorem. But now if you try to do this for a prime number p bigger than 2, you're led to these system of numbers, which I've called here z, zeta p. P, uh, zeta p is the pth root of unity, right? So on the circle, it is something like it is something like uh, right. For example, in the it's e raised power of two pi i over p or something. So cos okay, cos two pi by p and sine two pi by p or something. Uh, and the, these numbers fail to have the unique factorization property in general. Right, so when you, when you try to extend the system of numbers, as would be natural if you want to solve Fermat's last theorem, then you encounter a system of numbers for which unique factorization typically fails, right? And then, then the quantification of how much it fails led Kumar to one of the great works of mathematics in the 19th century, right? So Kumar kind of tried to analyze uh, what properties of this number, the obstruction to it being, having this property of unique factorization, and he proved many, many beautiful things, but he could not solve Fermat, okay? Okay, so Kumar gave a beautiful computationally checkable criterion for FLT. So he defined some numbers, right? These are called the Bernoulli numbers because they had been studied earlier by Bernoulli. But uh, their relevance to the arithmetic of these z zeta p, these kind of enlarged system of numbers, was pointed out in this really magnificent work of Kumar, right? Certainly Fields Medal winning, if there was a Fields Medal there. Okay, so this is again a okay, picture of Kumar. 
And so for Kumar's criterion was that Fermat's last theorem is true for the exponent p, so the fp. If p does not divide the numerator of one of these Bernoulli numbers for values of k between 2 and p minus 3 or 2 and p minus 3, even values, okay. So that's kind of a computationally checkable criterion if you're interested in working with p equal to 1 million and something, okay. Uh, then you can just compute, okay. And uh, so using this, people could prove various cases of Fermat. So Fermat was known for lots of exponents, right, for p millions of sort of uh, values, but no one knew how to do the whole thing. Okay, so in terms of, so the, what, what did that, so, so this is the, this is one of the great developments uh, that uh, uh, Fermat's last theorem led to, it led, it led one to enlarge the system of numbers and study the arithmetic of these numbers. It turned out that the natural things which one encountered and were proven to be true for Z failed in this larger context. Trying to then um, grapple with this and understand this led to the creation of lots of beautiful mathematics in the 19th century, right, so that's what Andrew Wiles meant by saying that uh, Fermat's last theorem uh, did lead to a creation of beautiful theories in the 19th century. But then now, but on the other hand, this the these theories were of la larger signif significance to mathematics. They led to the abstract concept of ideals and ring theory and all that. Uh, but they could not solve the problem, right? And in the 20th century, there was, there was a connection made of Fermat's last theorem to something totally different, which is called elliptic curves, right? Again, you just have to remember this name, elliptic curves. I'm not going to go too much into the meaning of it, okay? Okay, so now here's a curious kind of aside that the techniques Fermat knew, like congruences and descent, are known not to be enough to analyze solutions of this form, of this equation, when p is bigger than 3. Somehow they're inadequate, right? But Fermat's are, techniques are effective in the case of elliptic curves. What are elliptic curves? I'll come to. They're basically curves of some low, gene, low degree, cubic, like degree 3. But the way, so, uh, so Fermat's so techniques were effective in the case of elliptic curves, but the way elliptic curves got related to Fermat's last theorem in the latter half of the 20th century was very indirect, and it seems unlikely that Fermat could have discovered the 300 years of mathematics which went into connecting FLT and elliptic curves, right? So Fermat knew about elliptic curves, but it's highly unlikely that he could have found this connection, though one will never know, right, because he kind of, he's no longer around to ask him questions. So he, he carried the secret of his proof to his grave. So Fermat's proof of it, uh, but one will never know for sure, okay, but, uh, but it is a curious twist of history that in the end the solution of Fermat's last theorem is why is factors through this notion of elliptic curves, but in a way which Fermat is a very unlikely to have anticipated, right, it uses the very sophisticated mathematics which happened after his time and uh, yeah, so, okay, any questions about this? All right. So what are elliptic curves? Again, you just probably, uh, what are, in such a lecture, I mean, the best thing I can do is to mention some words, maybe give you some notions. If you're curious enough, interested enough, you should Google it, or you should look at a textbook, or you should follow, follow your interest, right? So I just want to pique your interest or whet your appetite, but I cannot satisfy it, right, in such a short lecture. So okay, I'm just going to mention some key terms. So elliptic curves are the rational numbers, right, are curves of genus one, okay, whatever that means, defined with a rational point. So for example, the circle is an example of a curve of genus zero. Right, so circles, kind of quadratic equations and so on can be solved. Uh, and Fermat was a great specialist in understanding which numbers are sums of squares and all that. But uh, the Fermat's last theorem, right, needs one to think about elliptic curves, which, which are very, very simple equations, very simple looking equations. They're equations of the form y squared equal to x cubed plus ax plus b. So that kind of, right, so let me draw, write down an elliptic curve. So for example, You can look at the elliptic curve, let's say y squared equal to x squared minus 1, right, into let's say uh, x plus 2. Right, so this is of the form y squared equal, equal to some cubic polynomial, right, and uh, yeah, so if you, if you want to plot, plot, plot its solution in the xy plane, with, let's say with real numbers, right, what, what does this equation look like? So to look at the zeros of this cubic equation, they are at minus 2, mm, minus, 1, and then there's 1, right? So this equation, something looks like something, okay, there's a very bad picture, okay, <laughs> it's 2 and 1, and, and, and then something like this, right? So anyway, so, so cubic, cubic equations are equations of degree 3, with certain further properties. The, the, some of the cubic should not have repeated roots. All right, so the connection between Fermat and elliptic curves, Fermat's last term and elliptic curves actually turned out to be the key to the solution of, of uh, Fermat's last theorem, right? Because, okay, so this is very surprising as, uh, for a reason I'll explain to you. Uh, okay, so there's an example of some elliptic curves, okay? 
So, and one of the most, one of the amazing properties of uh, elliptic curves is that you can look at two points which are which are rational in the sense the core xy coordinates are rational numbers, and you can add them, right, to produce a third point with, which is rational. So, you, what this process is called the chord and tangent process, right? So, this is the point p plus q. So, some of elliptic curves and elliptic uh, and curves of genus zero, like circles, circles, for example, have a multiplication law, right? You can look at two points on the circle and multiply them up to get a third point on the circle. So, here also there is a similar act of composition where you declare the sum of two points p, q to be this thing. You join, uh, you join p and q by a straight line, look at where it intersects the cubic curve on a third point, and then reflect it in the x-axis. Anyway, so, so there's some way of composing. And some of Fermat's idea of descent really need, needs you to have some law of composition. So, and it works only, therefore, for curves of genus 0 and 1, which is to say, low degree curves. What happened to it? Yeah. All right. So what is the story we are telling? Okay, that uh, there was this problem. Uh, it led to the considering of these larger system of numbers. These larger system of numbers have actually more complicated properties than one might expect. Uniqueness of factorization fails. That was a 19th century effort to understand Fermat's last theorem from that point of view. It did not succeed fully. It led to the development of lots of brilliant, beautiful, deep mathematics. Did not solve the problem. Then, uh, but more contemporary, more recently, people connected it with elliptic curves. Okay. And the interesting thing about curve, elliptic curves is it's, it's a bit astonishing that there's any such relation, right? Because if you look at Fermat's equation, x to the p plus y to the p plus z to the p equal to 0, for p bigger than 3, this is not a q elliptic curve. It's a, it's a curve of large genus, of large degree, and hence much more complicated than what an elliptic curve is. But the solution turns out to be a rooted in elliptic curves. So somehow it's very fascinating, okay? Uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this kind of slide because I'm running out of time also. Okay. Okay, so, so what was this idea? This was an idea of uh, two people, in fact, Hela Gourach, right? and a French mathematician in the, working in the 1970s, somehow had this kind of, la, kind of, what's it called, lateral thinking. He somehow, uh, kind of, uh, out of the blue, wrote down an elliptic curve starting with a solution of Fermat. Right, so now the idea of the solution of Fermat, those who want to know the proof, is a, is a proof by, by contradiction, right? So, so what, what is the basic logic in the proof of Fermat, which of course people have been trying for hundreds of years, this basic logic, that you try to get a contradiction, right? So suppose you want to solve Fermat, suppose you and I wanted to solve Fermat, so what you do is, okay, let's say, assume it's false, right? And what is the argument by contradiction? As you assume it's false and then you derive something from that false assumption which you know to be false, right? So somehow that is the logic of proof of contradiction. So you start with an alleged solution to Fermat's equation, p bigger than 2 prime, so suppose you start with a solution, a to the p plus b to the p plus c to the p equal to 0, right, p, uh, with, for, uh, with a, b, c, and z, with a, b, c, some integers, right, and a, b, c not equal to 0. You give yourself this, this solution which you don't expect to exist. And from that you have to derive some a contradiction, right. And you can, of course, massage the solution and say that, okay, you can assume that a, a b, c have no common factors, right, and stuff, stuff like that. So you kind of start with a solution and then somehow the idea of, these people is some, it's something which looks very naive, right? You just write down, instead of looking at these ABC as solutions of this very complicated equation of very high degree of complexity, high degree, x to the p plus y to the p plus z to the p equal to 0, right? So ABC, this triple gives you a point, right? It gives you a solution of the equation x to the p plus y to the p plus z to the p equal to 0. Right? So now you, you, you might be led to then thinking very carefully about this kind of equation and analyzing all its solutions and trying to say it has no such solutions. But that people could not succeed in doing. Instead, what Fry and uh, this French mathematician did in the 1970s and 80s was just kind of forget about the fact that it's a solution of this particular equation. You just write down an elliptic curve made out of these points. So you start, you write, this is called the Fry Elagouarche. I'm getting the spelling wrong. Okay. This is an elliptic curve, right, because it has a form y squared equal to cubic. But it's a particular kind of cubic, it's y squared into x into x minus a to the p into x plus b to the p. Okay, so starting with a solution which you don't think exists, just write down an elliptic curve. One might say, what good does that do you, right? But the point is that this elliptic curve was later, right, the Fry had the intuition, right, and both of them had this intuition that this elliptic curve is too exotic to exist. Somehow they couldn't exactly logically pin down what is the problem with this curve. And then one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, Jean-Pierre Serre, kind of pinned down exactly what was wrong in this curve, right? He at least conjecturally saw what was, what was fishy about this curve, right? 
And then Andrew Wiles kind of proved Fermat's last theorem by actually showing that no such elliptic curve can exist with this, with this shape, right? So, so, but somehow the, the, it's a very elaborate argument, so the contradiction is to some other property of this, of elliptic curves in general, which when localized to this elliptic curve produces your contradiction. Right, all these are going to be just words, but I just want, but maybe you can just think about these words, elliptic curves, uh, Fry curve, you can look it up. Okay. I, I'll also make these slides available if you want to. Yeah. Okay, so let me skip this slide as well. So I told you roughly what the idea is. So, the, so, so then as a logical consequence of this idea of associating an elliptic curve to a solution of Fermat's uh, equation, Somehow, uh, work of Ribbit and Serre implied that the Fermat elliptica, or the Fry elliptica, I should have called it, had contradictory in the properties in that world, which should not, which, which should, which should stop, stop it from being existing, right? Uh, but to pin this down, you have to actually invoke a very another notion of uh, sort of a property an elliptic curve has, which is much harder to explain in the, in the last five minutes I have. Right? But it's called modularity of elliptic curves. Okay, so there's a subject, for example, I work in. Uh, Okay, so the roughly speaking, right, the broader kind of grand line, or whatever, the, the, the big picture of the solution of Fermat's last theorem is, start with a, uh, how do you derive a contradiction? You start with a solution of Fermat, which you should, which you think should not exist, write down a degree, three, write down a degree elliptic curve, right, something of the form y squared equal to a cubic equation. So, so, so you're already doing something rather uh, strange and interesting, instead of studying directly the equation x to the p plus y to the p plus z to the p, you're kind of flattening the world and converting a degree, let's say p, p might be frightening large, like billions of numbers, right, billions of digits, but you convert it into a cubic equation, right, so you're doing something very uh, audacious, and, uh, but, but, but the point is you're doing it, that, yeah, in a way so that you can derive a contradiction. And ruling out that a solution, uh, yeah, the way you got, get a contradiction is, you show that E actually arises from a totally different source, right, which, does, which belongs to a world which Fermat did not think about, modular forms, and that gives you the contradiction, right. So Wiles, what, what he did was he actually, so he, this, this thing, this strategy was in place, so all he needed to do, all being in quotes, right, because that was a very, very deep statement, all he had to do was to show that an elliptic curve of this sort comes from a totally different world of uh, mathematics, right, which, which is more to do with complex analysis. It's more to do with holomorphic functions, with analytic functions, though, for those of you who have seen this. Uh, okay, so somehow in, in mathematics often great things happen by relating to very different areas of mathematics, right, so this is one example. You start with something from algebra or geometry, which is like an elliptic curve, and then try to relate it to something which is totally different, like a complex analytic function, okay, of a particular sort. Okay, so to explain the steps above and how they lead to a contradiction is a very complicated thing. But uh, I hope you will be stimulated by this lecture to find out more, right? For example, I recommend as a starting point, or there might be many starting points, there's a nice book by Simon Singh, because, because there's a very nice BBC documentary on Andrew Wiles' heroic solution of Fermat's last theorem. Right, because Andrew Wiles, I mean, he's a true, he, I mean, he tried, like, thought about this problem for seven years with tremendous focus and uh, came up with a series of brilliant ideas. It's not just like one big idea. It's like a series, he had a strategy, and he, it was, it's a magnificent piece of work. And uh, Simon Singh recounts the story, right? And in fact, at, at some point, Andrew Wise, if you, in mathematics, again, it's viewed as a very cold subject, just playing around with numbers. Actually, it requires a lot of emotional investment if you want to do well in it, right? So it requires tremendous commitment. And Andrew Wise thought about this problem for seven years, and when he talks about this period, he almost tears up, right? Because he remembers, and the moment of triumph, when he actually found the solution, he faltered. Initially, there was a, when he first declared a solution, it turned out to be wrong, but then he corrected it. So it's a, it's a great story. It's like a thriller, right? A mathematical thriller. So you can look at this book. And uh, so a one-line description of why the proof works can be summarized by saying, ah, another principle this kind of proof relies on is that it's very difficult to find, uh, by, it's very difficult to, th to find things which have only good properties, right? As you know in the real world. None of us is perfect. All of us have some flaws. But the point is Fermat's last theorem leads you to some, some object which is like perfect, right? And somehow you show that there is no perfection. There is no such object, okay? So that's again, very broadly speaking, colloquially, the virtue is hard to find in the world. Okay, maybe that's another thing you can right? so, take away. And this is Andrew Wiles, okay? Uh, he was knighted is, uh, for, for the solution. And, when it, and the work is truly amazing as the proof synthesizes many of the developments in number theory starting I mean, and, and as you see, the kind of the, the nationality of these mathematicians is all over the place. For example, even Ramanujan's work, and the paper Ramanujan wrote in 1916, was influential in kind of the developments which led to the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Okay? 
And uh, so it, in fact, it, the story is, if you read this BBC, doc, if you look at the BBC documentary, Andrew Wiles had gone to the library, public library in Oxford as a, as a, as a boy of 10. Uh, and he had found the statement of this problem, Fermat's last theorem, a problem, and he had wanted to work on it, right? So all, all his life he had nourished, the, he had nurtured, the, he had kind of nursed the ambition of wanting to work on it. But then when, he, when somebody related Fermat's last theorem, which is some kind, some kind of eccentric problem, to some very mainstream problems in number theory, that's when he really got kind of uh, excited and worked on this problem, right? But he had this kind of, again, he had the audacity and the tenacity and the ingenuity to actually then prove it, okay? So maybe it's, this is a good point to stop. Maybe I, this is the afternoon. I'm sure all of you are sleepy after having had a good lunch. So I won't I tax your attention anymore. Okay, thank you. I'll take any questions, right? Or, yeah. Uh, hello, Professor. I'm Vaibhav Shokin. Uh, Vaibhav? Since, okay. Yeah. Since there was no proof for about 300 years, and uh, so why did the mathematicians assume the theorem to be true? Yeah, that's a good question. It was not clear whether it's true. But, but as no one found a counterexample, even by searching, let's say, numerically, it was just that uh, it seemed empirically quite likely to be true. No one found a counterexample even if after trying. Right. But uh, one counter example that you showed for the sum of four, uh, three numbers to the power of four. Yeah, so but that's, that's but a that's very not a large number. That, that's not a counter example to Fermat, it's some variant of that. Yeah. So there was no, there was actually, yeah, that's true. There was no good reason to think that Fermat's last theorem was true. There was no good logical reason to think. And that's why Wes, Wiles got excited when it was shown to be a consequence of something else which people were sure to be true. Right? It was, the people really started uh, working very hard on it, or rather, Wiles started working hard on it when it was shown to be. Definitely true because it was a consequence of something much more structural in mathematics. Otherwise, Fermat's last theorem by itself is some, it's not clear whether it's true or not, yeah, until one proves it. Yes. Um, hi, Professor. I'm Sia. Uh, I'm from Delhi. And so my question is that uh, I really enjoyed your lecture. I feel it was very easy to follow. Like, I fell asleep in between for a minute, but I, I think I got what you were saying. Okay. <laughs> but like, um, what I'm confused about is like, what do you want us to take away from this lecture? Well, like, what I want, to I, I want you to take away is that mathematics is driven by simple questions. The questions are very simple, they're challenging, uh, they reward effort, and uh, the, 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 the theories, I mean, it's a very beautiful subject and you need to, it requires perseverance. Mathematics is, quickness has an importance in anything. If you're quick and clever, it's all, it's all to the good, but you need not be necessarily, but what it requires is perseverance. Marathon, the marathon aspect of mathematics is what, even in my work, right, I, I tend to work on a problem for long periods of time. I, I, for example, myself worked on a problem, which was my dream problem, for uh, 10, uh, since I finished my PhD in 1995, for 10 years I worked on it. And then I got the first kind of, then we started solving it after 10 years. So it took me 10 years to solve my dream problem, which is related to this Fermat's Last Theorem business. In fact, my work gives an, another proof of Fermat's Last Theorem. It's a rearranged proof. It uses Wiles' techniques. But so, yeah, so that's one thing I would like you to take away. That mathematics is beautiful, mathematics rewards effort, and mathematics also is uh, a marathon a subject. Not a hundred meter dash. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm Vinayak. So, so you said you worked on a problem for ten years. That's mm. a long time. So you didn't like in the middle thing. Okay, that maybe I should switch to a different problem, or I should uh, maybe give this up. Maybe this is actually not solvable. Yeah. So how did you keep those thoughts away? No, but when you work on a problem, you're not just saying that, oh, I'm going to bang my head against this problem and do or die effort. I mean, you're working motivated by that problem, right? But you're working on several other things stimulated by that problem. So that, that's, the, that's the hallmark of a good question, because even if you can't answer it right away, it'll lead you to do various other things which are interesting in their own right. They may not solve the question, but in the end, what you're hoping to be is lucky enough that what you've done in the end will amount to a solution. So it's not, it's not an all or nothing thing. You start working on it. You keep it in mind, and you hope, when I th thought about this problem, I did not ho hope to solve it, but I knew that thinking about this question will force me or lead me to do interesting things. So that's the kind of strategy which is, I think, more fruitful, rather than just saying, oh, I'm going to solve this problem and nothing else. It, it is my goal, but I will do other things motivated by that problem. It's like when you, 
when you are, to give a very broad analogy, suppose man, man has wanted to reach the moon since thousands of years, right? If you look at the moon, you say, ah, oh, it will be nice to go to the moon. But you can't jump on the spot and try to get to the moon. You have to kind of let the technology develop. You can you have to let hundreds of years elapse. Thousands, and then maybe there'll be technology and then, but it's important to keep it that dream in mind. And that might influence you. And the, Andrew Wise actually says at some point that one of the talents of a mathematician or a researcher is to, or that's a general perception also, is to know when a problem is ready to be thought about. Sometimes you might be thinking about a problem which is not, for which the technology is not in place, right? So somehow you need to have, a, as a, after doing mathematics for se several years, or you need to have a good intuition about what problem is, it is possible to solve, right? So somehow he had this, uh, he has this intuition, or he kind of, yeah, in this, yeah. So, I mean, when someone's starting their research career or just looking into getting into research, there are a lot of problems that interest you, right? How do you choose which one to work upon? I mean, it's not, I mean, yeah, you don't really go for a problem. First of all, you have to learn, you have to, you have to sort of develop. Yeah, it's like, it's like uh, if you want to run, a, run in the Olympics or something, right? You can't, go, you can't straight away go to the Olympics. You have to first train, you have to sort of acquire some expertise, you have to... So you have, to, you have to learn things and kind of uh, develop taste, develop expertise. Then you'll, so that'll be your under, undergraduate education. Then you'll go to graduate school. You'll, you'll think, ah, maybe this area interests me. Even then you don't, you don't know what you want to do. Then you go to a graduate school, wherever. And then you take courses. And so it's a, it's a long process. But th at some point you might find something which excites you really. And which somehow uh, your training leads you to and which you, yeah. So it's kind of a, it's a, kind of a complicated process. But yeah, it's a, mathematics is driven by problems. And that's another thing. Many people in school, the way perhaps it's taught sometimes, you think mathematics is a finished subject, right? That it was done and there's nothing more to do. But actually, that's not true. Mathematics is uh, like a t what is known as tip of an iceberg. Much of, most of mathematics remains to be discovered, right? So it's kind of, uh, yeah, there are lots of problems out there. But one has to be, as you say, one has to be careful what problem you choose to think about. You mentioned about uh, Ramanujan. Yeah. Yeah, but Ramanujan wrote a paper in 1916 called On Some, on some Properties of Arithmetical Functions. And uh, yeah, he made some interesting, I mean, again, Ramanujan was, of course, a great mathematician. He had uh, very good instincts. So he was looking at questions which at that time may have seemed kind of, why, why should one look at this, right? So properties of, as you know, the tau function. And uh, the kind of congruences he discovered for the tau function led Jean-Pierre Serre and people like that to kind of try to understand these empirical things he had discovered. And that led to Sayers' conjecture, which is some conjecture he made in the 70s and 80s, 70s. And that is related to Fermat's last year. Yeah. yeah, I think the solutions were finally published in 2008 or 9. Yeah. But I worked on it from 1995 to 2008. Yeah. Eight. But we had the initial breakthrough in 2004. So, yeah. So, and yeah, in fact, from 1995 to 2005, I worked in India. Uh, in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and that's where somehow I, uh, I uh, grew and matured as a mathematician and developed some kind of, uh, developed some sort of, uh, yeah, viewpoint, which helped me solve for sales conjecture. Uh, hello, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. my name is Pranav and I'm from Hyderabad. Yes. Uh, you mentioned about like, the, like in the previous answer, you said that we should know when the problem is ready to be solved. I didn't quite understand what you meant. Yeah, that's a very hard thing to know. I mean, it's just an intuition. You need, I mean, this is a man in mathematics. Intuition is very important. You need to have a sense of where the subject is, right? So somehow, I mean, some people have that sense that basically you want to do the hardest thing which is possible, right? You don't want to do something impossible. I mean, so so to guess what is a problem which is significant, difficult, looks impossible to solve, but actually can be solved using current technology, right? So it's, 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 there's, there's no exact science to it. So you need to have good taste, you need to have some sense of what mathematics is ready to do right now. It's kind of, it doesn't have a very precise sense, what I said. Yeah. What about, a lot of what I said is not very precise, it's just to give you a general idea. Any other questions? Thank you for listening. <laughs>